<sighs> Waiting for folks to stream in. I would certainly hope more than six people show up for one of the more useful lectures of the term. But if not, that's their loss. Can let regular expressions remain a mystery to them forever. <clears throat> streaming in. Another minute or so, and then I'll get moving. Should be a short one today. At least slide short every time I say actually going to be short. I get on a tangent. Okie dokie, I suppose I'll uh, just go ahead and get moving here. Um, so uh, I think I mentioned uh, last week that sort of um, uh, last week is sort of the was the last of the sort of nuts and bolts kind of uh, ones of the course or the last sort of fundamental programming and general application stuff we'd be doing in this class. And what we're going to be doing for the rest of the term, beginning with today, is stuff that I sometimes call special topics. Just because something is a special topic, though, doesn't mean it's not something you're going to use all the time. <clears throat> what we're going to be talking about today is essentially working with text data or strings. And I'm going to introduce today a special topic um, that is actually one of the most powerful and useful things you could possibly take out of a class like this, which often gets neglected in uh, like data programming classes and especially like our programming classes. What we're going to learn about is regular expressions. Um, we'll get into what those are a little bit later, but there's something not unique to the R language. Every programming language has some sort of library for uh, um, regular expressions. Most of them just sort of have processing for that built into them, R, Python, you name it. Um, but they're tremendously powerful for performing lots of operations. And the more comfortable you get with regular expressions, the faster and easier it's going to be for you to deal with text data um, and sort of just generally do a million different things. You'll see. They're very powerful. Yeah. Uh, and then after this, we're going to be uh, next week is going to be a lecture on the special topic of uh, geospatial data. So working with maps and plotting and, and geospatial data, for where to get it, things like tidy census uh, for getting census data, um, which is sort of something that's like a, for many people, it seems like a niche topic, but it's so easy to do in R um, that I really want people to know about it because it really opens a lot of doors for doing um, everything with mapping and, and geospatial data and geospatial matches that um, uh, are sort of closed to you if you work in some other software platforms. Turns out they're all, it's quite trivial to do in R. <clears throat> and then the last one is going to be a hour of me ranting about reproducible research and then uh, a bunch of discussion on how to do uh, um, sort of nice tables and plots from models using a few different uh, modern R packages that you probably won't be introduced to in, in any other classes, but useful to you. Okay, so today though, today's about playing with string. So 
Uh, the data I'm going to use for today to demonstrate sort of string manipulation uh, is real data from uh, King County's data.kingcounty.gov website. These are data on actual food safety inspections for restaurants and other uh, <clears throat> um, businesses around King County. Uh, this is a big data frame. They're fairly large. This sort of thing you probably don't want to keep like pulling down over and over again online because it might take a little bit of time. I forget exactly how many rows there are, but we'll see in a bit. Probably 100,000 or something like that. Um, yeah, I might just pull them down. Okay. Um, something I do here when I pull them down is notice I'm downloading the CSV straight from my website, but I'm also specifying the column types here. Um, this is because a couple of the column types might not read in the way you want them to when it sees the CSV. For instance, I manually specify a date for the last column. Um, this is just something nice to do if you find you load in a CSV file and um, some columns keep coming in kind of funky. You could specify the C basically says character column, N is numeric, I is integer, capital D is date. Okay. So, so this is what these data look like. Okay, so uh, this iteration of them has 258,630 rows with 23 columns. Pretty big, not going to be browsing around in this manually too much. Um, what we see here is that the data frame begins with a name column that contains things like at the shack LLC, 10 Mercer something, which you could probably guess are the names of businesses that were inspected um, by King County Health Authority or whoever it is exactly does that, I forget. Um, you got things like a program identifier, shack coffee, which is some sort of shortened name for it. We have a date that the last inspection was done, which sometimes seems to be missing, but other times they have a provided date. They have a description of the type of place it is, like it has zero to 12 seats and it's in risk category one. The risk categories probably are related to the types of food and beverages served there. Some things are very low risk, like they're just making coffee. Some things are very high risk, like if they're serving raw shellfish, who knows, right? The address is the actual street address, the city it's in, the zip code, its phone number, its longitude and latitude, which you could use if you do the optional mapping homework uh, next week, uh, and a bunch of other stuff, the type of inspection. An important one here is the inspection score. The inspection score here is sort of a index of exactly uh, how bad a given restaurant did on a particular inspection. Okay? Um, so higher is worse, basically. Uh, inspection results indicate things like unsatisfactory. Did they have to close the business due to the inspection? Types of violations, descriptions of them, and then some sort of other uh, sort of random information, the grade, the date. Okay. Um, yeah, so we have a lot of data here. You could actually potentially do a lot with this because we also have geospatial stuff, but we're not going to use it for now. What we do see here is we have a tremendous amount of text data. And if we want to mess with any of this text data, clean it up, work with it in some way, like maybe we want to extract portions of street addresses to figure out where things are, um, we need to know how to do some text manipulation. And that's what today's all about. OK, <clears throat> so let's talk about strings. A general programming term for a unit of character data is a string. A string is a sequence of characters. Common strings you encounter in your life are words. The word programming right here is a string. It contains 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 characters. They are, their order and the nature of those particular characters matters. If you move them around, it's not the same word anymore. This is a string. Okay? In R, terms like strings and character data are pretty much interchangeable. When people say a string, they mean character data. When they say character data, it's typically made up of strings. Okay. In other programming languages and in other situations, strings very often refer also to sequences of numeric information, like binary strings or also hexadecimal strings. Okay. So these are examples of binary strings. 
We rarely directly use binary strings in R, but we sometimes do use hexadecimal strings in R, usually to specify colors. If you've ever seen me specify a color in a ggplot by doing something like this, <clears throat> like saying uh, ggplot something plus like gm point color equals, uh, you know, something just like, you know, something that looks like that, okay? That is a hexadecimal code that specifies a particular color. This just indexes essentially red, green, blue values um, on a hexadecimal scale, okay? That is a string you might give that's not in binary, but not also in like normal human language or anything. Hexadecimal strings are pretty common for specifying colors, <clears throat> okay? Um, but there's other types of strings like that. Okay, the thing to note about strings though, is that strings are sequences of numbers or values rather than a single number. This is what makes them a string. 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0 is not the same thing as, what is this? Uh, 1,110,000. Those are not equivalent things. This is actually eight separate characters that are not interchangeable and don't indicate like an overall number. So one thing that separates a string from a number is that leading zeros in a string are meaningful. If I cut this zero out of here, this string right here would be a different thing. This zero is actually important and conveys meaning. So strings are different. They're not numbers. We're not necessarily counting up and down exactly. Um, this string could be used to represent a number, but this is actually just values in individual places in something, kind of like a word, right? So that's one thing that separates a string from a number. If your leading zeros mean something, you probably don't have a conventional number. Zip codes in this way are character data or a string rather than a number. Okay, so let's talk about basics in working with strings or character data. So uh, we've seen a bunch of functions already for building and manipulating string data in this class. There's one that we used a little while back, you probably don't remember, and that's perfectly fine. Um, the nCharacter function. nCharacter gets the number of characters in each element of a character vector. So if, for instance, I was interested in how many characters are in each of the zip codes in my data to see if they're all 10-digit or 5-digit zip codes, I could do something like this take my restaurant's data, and then mutate a new column named zip length, which is equal to the number of characters in each element of the zip code column. And then I'm going to count the zip length column to see sort of the distribution of different lengths of zip codes. Well, it turns out 258,629 of these zip codes are five-digit zip codes, and a single one of them is a 10-digit zip code, which probably shouldn't be in there. Okay. So this is just counted out how many characters there are. Most zip codes, nearly all of them in the data, are five-digit zip codes, so n character has counted that out for me. Pretty straightforward function. Sometimes you just want to know how many letters there are. It's the kind of thing you do want to run on something like zip codes. If you load in a CSV of zip codes, run n character across it and tabulate them and see if any of them got the leading zeros chopped off. Useful thing for it. Also something if you've got like a, maybe you're working with survey data or something that has individual ID numbers and you know they should all be like 10 digit IDs, N character will let you know if they're all 10 digit IDs or not. You can use it for quick checks. It's good to know. Okay. Another one you should be familiar with at this point because we've talked about it in the lab. You've used it on a couple different homeworks uh, is substring. Substring I could use here to make sure I pull out only the proper five digits of those zip codes. Let's say instead of there being one bad zip code, there were a whole bunch of them scattered throughout the data. And what I want to do is just extract the first five digits from those zip codes. I could do this. I'm going to overwrite my restaurant's data by saying assign to restaurants using the restaurant's data and then mutate a new zip5 column, which is going to be five digit zip codes only, which is equal to a substring of zip code, specifically its first through fifth characters. 
So anything that's five characters long is going to be unchanged. It's going to keep all of its five characters. If, however, it's longer than five characters, it's going to chop off any additional characters. Okay. Ah, so here's a great question uh, here. Are there any library import steps to pull in these data so we can follow along? No worries if not. Reader package um, is it so far. Uh, and dplyr. If you just load tidyverse, that loads everything we're going to use today, though, so you could do that too. Okay. Um, so I can now say, take the restaurant's data and then get distinct five digit zip codes and look at the first six. And I can see here, there's no like greater than five digit zip codes in here. The previous one, uh, previous five, uh, longer than five digit zip code I think was in the first five. So you'd see it here if it was still there. Okay, so substring is good for chopping up some string into smaller portions. You can use that for some fairly advanced stuff like we did in the lab on Monday, okay? Next one is paste. We've also seen paste and paste zero a bunch. I'll talk about paste zero again in a minute. So what paste does is it will combine multiple single values or vectors of values together to produce uh, a single string. So it can take multiple strings and make one string out of it. In this case, maybe what we wanna do is take all the different components of addresses in our data and paste them together to make a proper mailing address. I'm going to, again, overwrite my restaurant's data with the restaurant's data and then mutate to create a mailing address column, which is equal to pasting together the address column, comma, space, the city column, comma, space, Washington, space, a five-digit zip code, separated by nothing. The separator nothing here says don't insert any spaces or anything between each one of these values I've added here. Now if I say look at the restaurant's data and then give me distinct values of mailing addresses and then get the first six observations, we've now created mailing addresses. The first one is 2920 Southwest Avalon Way. That's the address, the comma space, the city is Seattle, comma space Washington, space, the five digit zip code is 98126. But it's done for the entire column of 250,000 of these entries. 10 Mercer Street, Seattle, Washington, 98109, 1001 Fairview Avenue North, Unit 1700A, Seattle, Washington, 98109. Okay, I've stitched together 258,000 mailing addresses. So if you had some sort of a data set that you want to do something like automatically prepare mailers to mail out to a large survey population or something, you could stitch the addresses together from a bunch of different fields in your data and automate this process, which is something I actually did for a field experiment quite a long while back. I had to produce envelopes with uh, um, a bunch of different combinations of information, including the hidden ID number, and it would paste them all together, and then I sort of ran it off to the printer. Here's a question. Could you explain why you're piping restaurants into restaurants again? So what I'm doing is I'm overwriting the data. If I didn't have the assignment operating in restaurants over here, if I make these changes, this mutate, it would just display them in the console. To keep it, I have to overwrite the original data to add the column to it. That's all I'm doing. Next one was, can you explain the use of spaces inside the quotes, separate equals that, and paste versus paste zero? I'll get paste versus paste zero here in a second. But as far as the spaces and stuff, um, the basic idea is that um, paste just jams together all the different things that you give it. Um, by saying separator equals nothing over here, it's actually doing the same thing paste zero does. It's not inserting any spaces in between these things. So what I have to do is manually put the spaces where I want them. The reason I don't want paste to add the spaces for me is I want don't want any space before the commas. I don't want it to go 2920 Southwest Avalon Way and then introduce a space before the comma because it's going to look awkward. It's purely aesthetic. Instead, I'm saying, okay, I want the comma lined up right to the address, then a space after it and city, but then I want city to immediately be followed by the comma here and not have a space after it. Separator equals nothing prevents it from inserting spaces in all those gaps. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. So 
And also, did my answer to the prior question make sense? Great. Always good when I make sense. That's a good day for me. Okay, moving on. So, paste zero, as you anticipated. Paste zero is a shortcut for paste when the separator equals nothing. So if I say paste the numbers one through five to the first five letters of the alphabet, I will by default get this, the number one pasted to A with a space in between, two space B, three space C, four space D, five space E. You can imagine the way paste is working is taking the vector one through five, sort of just stacking it up vertically, and then taking A through E, stacking it up vertically next to the numbers, and then just pasting them left to right element by element. Like most things in R, paste operates element by element. It's kind of like if you did addition on two different vectors, it would add them sort of across element by element. It does the same thing with paste. By default, if you don't tell paste a separator, it inserts a space between everything, okay? You could instead say, like I did on the last slide, the exact same stuff pasted together, but separator equals nothing, and it doesn't insert a space between them. It's the same values, but no space in between. If I'm too lazy to type comma separator equals nothing, I can instead type paste zero, and it gives me the same result. This means paste zero is a shortcut for this syntax up here. You often see me use paste zero because I'm really lazy and I don't like typing out things like that if I can help it, so I'll use paste zero instead. On the last slide, I showed you you could do separator equals nothing and be explicit. You can do whatever makes sense to you. I tend to just immediately remember paste zero and use it all the time. Okay. So. Paste does not just have separator as a way to tell it how to paste stuff together. So separator equals is an argument that lets you control how it does what I call entry-wise squishing, like we saw in the prior slide. Well, it has another argument you can use, which I haven't, I don't think I've used in this class yet, which is called collapse. Collapse controls if and how the results of paste go from being a vector of strings to being a single string. If you use collapse, the result of your paste command will not be a vector of entries. It will be a length one vector with a single entry. Collapse collapses everything down to one element. It's hard to explain what that is verbally, but it's very easy to show it. Here's an example five of them actually. If I say I want to paste together the first five letters of the alphabet and collapse them using exclamation point, the result is a length one character vector that is the first five letters of the alphabet separated by exclamation points. So it's taken the first element A, the second element B, put an exclamation between them and combined them into one element, and then done that all the way down to E. So our length five vector here became a length one vector where its elements are separated by our collapse character. Okay, you might be like, why would I ever wanna do that? You'll come up with reasons quite possibly. I use collapse uh, reasonably often for preparing special types of vectors. Here's another example. I'm gonna paste together the first five numbers and the first five letters and separate them by pluses instead of, say, spaces. I get a length five vector, the same as the inputs, of one plus a, two plus b, three plus c, four plus d, five plus e. So it's combined one and a with a plus, two and b with a plus, and so on. Here's this one. Let us paste zero together, the numbers one through five, and the first five letters and collapse them with three exclamation points. Notice what happens here. It is first pasting together the entries element by element, so I get one and a, and then it collapses them by the question marks. So I get one a, question marks, two b, question marks, three c, question marks, four d, question marks, five e. So it does the pasting operation this with the separator before the collapse operation. We get, because we used collapse, a length one vector. Here I said, 
let's paste together the numbers one through five and the letter Z separated by asterisks. Again, pasting things together works the same way that like addition and other basic math does in R. If this thing is length five and this thing is length one, it will recycle the length one, one to be five in length, the same length as this. It will just repeat the Zs. Thus we get one asterisk Z, two asterisk Z, three Z, four Z, and five Z. It's done vector recycling. So there's as many Zs as there are numbers on the left. And then it's separated them all by asterisks. The last stupid example is I have pasted together one through five, just the letter Z, separated by an asterisk, but collapsed with a space tilde space. So you see here, I've designed it so it lines up nicely. We see the exact same things are pasted together as before, but instead of it being a length five vector, it's a length one vector where each one of those old elements is separated by space tilde space. Okay, so these are all sort of the different combinations of collapse and separate you might see. Um, and if you ever need to produce things like this, you have a slide you know you can find and go back to and figure out how to do it. Don't try to memorize all this. It's kind of esoteric until you actually need to do it. So a question in here. Can you collapse with no character specified that as paste letters one to five collapse equals that? I believe you can. I think it will just collapse them right away, which is a, a common thing I've done before. Next one. Why was the address we made before a length one vector even though it didn't use collapse? Ah, it isn't. So if we look at these addresses, this is a length 258,000 vector. It's the entire column of data. Just so happens to be each element of it is, yeah, length one, but it's pasted together element by element. So it's taken the first element of address, the first element of city, the first element of zip five to make this first element. But this, this, and this are all length 258,000 columns. And so it actually hasn't collapsed them. There's 258,000 entries in this column. Does that make sense? Yeah, if we did collapse, it would collapse all 258,000 of the addresses together into a single element that would be massive. Not a thing you'd want to do unless your data frame contained like all the work, each row contained like one word and all the words in a book. Maybe if you're working with text data in that way, you could do something like that. Okay. Yeah. Great questions. Okay. So now we're going to spend the middle part of this lecture talking about the stringer package in R, which is the tidyverse string manipulation package. Okay. So Stringer is yet another one of these R packages from the tidyverse like ggplot and dplyr and tidyr and lubridate and reader. Stringer makes working with string and character data easier. Okay? It doesn't actually introduce any truly new functionality. It actually uses another package to perform all its operations, but Stringer makes it easy to do these things. So what does it do? It replaces some basic string functions, things like paste and in character, uh, with new versions that are, for some people, easier to remember or are less touchy with factors and missing values, or they give better warning messages. It adds functions that let you remove white space and pad it out, which are common operations to do on messy data. It performs some helps you perform tasks related to pattern matching too, which we're going to spend a lot of time on today. How to detect, locate, extract, match, replace, and split strings based on regular expressions. Regular expressions being a logical language for telling computers how to find things in text. Because computers, unfortunately, do not understand human speech about specifying what you're looking for in text. So you have to use some sort of language to tell them exactly what you want. So there are base R versions of most stringer functions, or at least stringy versions of them. Stringy is a powerful string manipulation package that we don't tend to directly use. And okay? these tend to be hard to use. Stringer is easier to use. And Stringer also has one additional nice little convenience feature. If you load up the Stringer library with library Stringer, you'll find a cool thing. I load up Stringer. 
if I can't remember what stringer function I want to use, I can do this, str underscore, and every important function in stringer begins with the text str underscore. Okay, so I can browse through and find all my stringer functions. Good packages nowadays do this sort of thing to make it easier to find the, the functions that you want. So here's a question, remedial question. Is library tidyverse the same as individually doing library stringer, library dplyr, et cetera? Yes, it just happens to load a certain set of those packages. So if I say library tidyverse, library tidyverse, oh, I guess it was already loaded, so it doesn't show what it's loading. It loads like six or eight of those packages, including stringer. And the other extremely important question, why do I have a picture of Idris Elba on my stringer page? And that, my friend, is a question you're asking because you haven't watched enough good television. Idris Elba's character in The Wire is Stringer Bell. So very good TV, five of the best seasons of television in history. You should watch yourself, uh, watch some of The Wire. Yeah, anyway, uh, yeah. So that's my bad, my bad slide joke of, uh, of this, this lecture. Very proud of myself for that one too. It makes me smile every time. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, um, yeah. So the stringer package is one of those packages I always load, I always use. It's one of my favorite tidyverse packages. It's tremendously powerful. Okay. So contains a lot of functions. I'm gonna walk you through some of them. We're gonna use a bunch, not all of them though. It's a big package. So stringer first, contains a bunch of equivalencies to functions I've already shown you. For example, you've probably seen me use string underscore sub instead of substring. It's basically the same thing as the substring function, but it adds one useful, powerful thing. Unlike the base r substring function, string sub can also take negative indices. If you put in negative values in the from and to, Instead of counting from the beginning of the string forward, it counts from the back of the string backward. So if for some reason I wanted to take the text Washington and I really badly wanted it to be washing it, I could say string sub Washington, start at the first character, which is W, and finish on the third from the end character. One, two, three. So it goes washing it and gives me only up to the third from the back character. There are many situations you could probably think of if you spend much time working with text data where what you care about is not counting from the front of the string but chopping off a bunch of stuff at the end. For example, file suffixes like in lab this week, we want to get rid of the dot CSVs. I said negative four or something or negative five at the end and chopped off all the dot CSVs. Pretty handy. String C, string combine, is just like paste. It's basically a replacement for paste, except it's actually better because it's a paste that defaults to separator nothing like paste zero. But when you want to add a separator, you can. So string C does the best of both worlds. If I say string C letters one through five and the number one through five, it doesn't insert stupid spaces in between them and it behaves like paste zero that I use all the time, but I could add a separator if I want. I like string C a lot, but the thing is, is my brain remembers paste zero a lot faster than string underscore C, so I use paste zero most of the time. If you remember string C though, fantastic, because it's a better function kind of. Okay. So next, string underscore length is equivalent to n character. If I say how many letters are there in weasels, I already know this, there's seven, but maybe I want to count again. String length weasels also gives me seven. These are exactly equivalent functions. Use the one you remember. Maybe you can't remember n character, but string length is easy to remember. Now you know. Okay. Some other handy functions I like to use all the time are functions for changing the case of all of your text. You can convert all the strings to uppercase, all your strings to lowercase, all your strings to title case. This is pretty handy um, to do while you're cleaning data before you start working with something or when you're searching for values. So for instance, maybe you've got some administrative data that like all administrative data are garbage. So you do something like give me 
the first six unique values of the restaurant's data city column. And I see stupid stuff like this. Seattle, Seattle sentence case, Seattle all caps, Kent all caps, Bellevue all caps, Kenmore all caps, Issaquah sentence case, okay? Or title case rather. This is dumb. This is because they don't sanitize the inputs to their database and make sure that they all have uniform capitalization and stuff. As far as R is concerned, Seattle like this and Seattle like this are not related to each other in any way. R does not recognize that these are the same thing like we do. So what you might want to do is go to every character column in your data set and convert it all to upper or lower case. This is one of the first things I do when I clean a new or I'm working with a new data set. I say I do not trust anyone to capitalize, not capitalize, or mixed capitalize all the stuff in the data. I'm a scrub the whole thing so it's all uppercase data usually. So to do that, I'm going to overwrite the original restaurant's data with a fixed version of the restaurant's data where I'm going to take restaurants and then I'm going to mutate across the name, address, and city columns. These are all columns I'm going to use today for some stuff. And I'm going to convert them all to uppercase. Okay? I could theoretically have said across where is dot character, and that would go through every character data column in the data set and do this. That's the kind of thing I like to do as a scorched earth attack on a large administrative data set, scrub it all. Um, but in this case, I know I only want to mess with name, address, and city, and I don't care about the other junk. Okay, now if I get head unique restaurant city, same thing I did here. Ah, now it's just Seattle, Kent, Bellevue, Kenmore, Issaquah, Burien. There's no more lowercase junk clogging up my uh, data frame. Maybe there's typos and that becomes a much harder game. I could tabulate all of the city values and see if there's mistyped ones, which because it's administrative data is entirely possible. Okay. Actually, in this case, I'm pretty sure they are not because they probably have sanitized that input. Anyway, so this is kind of nice to do. I recommend doing this all the time. Nice thing with something like string to title too is once you've made them all uppercase and stuff like that, later if you want to produce them in a table or something like that, you can just go right back to string to title and make them look nice and display them in a table or something. Or your plots or whatever. Okay, here's another uh, useful one. Yep. Sorry, Chuck. Uh, in the previous slide, so uh, can we also do like, uh, uh, so I'm not getting what's the function of tilde over here. Mm -hmm. And can we also do like, string to upper and within the parentheses we just put name and it would do everything convert it into uh, upper uh, like caps so we could do what in in the parentheses uh, so without doing the mutate uh, we could we just write string to upper and put name inside the bracket can we do that no you could do um so uh, the thing is we need the mutate here because what mutate is essentially doing is it's taking the data frame, the data frame goes into mutate and then inside of mutate your functions have access to all the columns inside that data frame. And when you make a change to any of those columns, it goes back to the original data frame. These functions like string to upper can't work on a data frame. They can only work on an individual column. If you want to do, if you don't want to use mutate and you want to make a change to restaurants, you have to do that awkward syntax of like restaurants dollar sign name and assign to that string to upper and then inside here restaurants dollar sign name, if you oh. know what I mean. Okay. So what is the period doing in this case? Okay. This is yeah, great question. So the syntax here with the tilde and the period is a what's referred to as a lambda function being used inside of the across function. So if you're using mutate and across, with across you specify one or more columns in your data set you want to do something to. And so here I've said I want to do something to name, address, and city. The syntax over here with the tilde, the function, parentheses, period, this tilde right here says, okay, I want to run a function based on whatever is on the right side of this tilde. It could be a single function, but I could also use multiple functions over here on the right side. What the period is saying is one by one, I want you to take 
the name column, the address column, and then the city column and replace that period with each one of those columns. So if I take this syntax right here, put it in here, I can't actually run it because I don't have the data loaded. This is basically equivalent to me instead saying this. Easiest way to do this is it's essentially the equivalent of that operation I just did here with some equal sums. Okay, so what the across is doing is essentially taking the string to upper, saving me from typing it three times like this, but it's actually just running string to upper name and replacing name with it, string to upper address, replacing address with it, string to upper city, replacing city with it. Um, so this is just a short syntax for doing this operation down here, so I don't have to do them all manually. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, got it. Um, yeah, that's all that's going on. And it just so happens the syntax for it is you can either do tilde string to upper this or in equivalent way you can write it with this. No parentheses or period and no tilde. And these will both work. The nice thing about using it with the tilde here is I can add additional arguments. So if there was some extra argument I wanted to add here, I could add it here, but I can't add the extra arguments as easily down here. So if we want to add other functions, how are they used here? Like we also want to use another function along with string to upper. Yeah, we could do this. Like you could essentially layer as many functions as you want in here, nesting them. Okay. Yeah, okay. you can also do some weird stuff. Like I could theoretically um, period there and then internally pipe it to string trim or something and you can you can do all kinds of stuff um, inside after this tilde because what the tilde basically says is figure out what all this stuff after the tilde is put it all together and after you're done uh, run it all on each of these individually and it will substitute all the periods in here uh, will get substituted with each column individually you can do some wonky stuff it's more advanced though yeah thanks thanks for that uh, yeah, so here's an excellent question that I knew would get triggered by my uh, trying to save typing. Um, how do you copy and paste across multiple columns at once? So are you saying multiple columns or multiple rows? Across rows, yeah, when you copy and paste a column. Okay, um, so if you hold down Control and Alt or whatever is your Mac equivalent and then tap, say, from where I'm at, the up arrow, your cursor will expand. Once your cursor is expanded, anything you type will be appear in all three of those locations simultaneously. Anything you paste will be pasted in all those locations simultaneously. So if you have some reason, you know, to go across multiple lines simultaneously, the control on the alt is really useful. Another thing you can do is hold down alt and alt will make it so you select by box rather than line by line which helps you do this sort of operation. So maybe you're like, well, okay, I wanna replace these with something else. Maybe I want them to be double equals, something like that. Maybe what I wanna do is I wanna grab out to here. Maybe I just want this box selection is really useful. So Alt will do that. Um, there's all sorts of little handy dandy things built into an IDE like this that um, you often don't know about. Um, they're out there and if you poke around, you'll sometimes see like sort of power users of R and R studio doing some just crazy stuff. Um, this of course doesn't hold a candle to the kinds of stuff you can do in like Emacs or something like that, but I find it to be pretty handy. Um, very often I'm doing uh, operations along really tall uh, vectors of stuff. Uh, where this becomes super handy to be able to do. Um, so where's an example of this? Uh, yeah, here's sort of an example. This is me loading in and manually naming an immense amount of survey data. This is actually the Project in Human Development in Chicago Neighborhoods Community Survey in 1995 for my dissertation. Um, very often I'll have some kind of case where I have a million things in here like this, 
And what I need to do, for instance, is uh, recode an entire section. So maybe this entire class of variables here don't need to be PE, but they need to be like, you know, KN. It's really fast to do it that way instead of manually retype everything. Um, super handy functionality. Okay. Anyway, fun stuff. Next thing. Another useful function in Stringer is string trim for trimming white space. So it's sometimes common to get data from, say, a survey, terrible administrative data, something like that, that has extra spaces inserted all over the place. The police data I get all the time has it all the time. So even though they've been on a modern computer system for decades, the default format for the police data I get is still tailored for punch cards, which means each entry in the data is a fixed width. No matter how much text is punched in, that thing is always like 20 characters wide, so it has tons of white space all over. Okay, um, So maybe you want to get rid of those white spaces. So if we have data that look like this, I say head, unique, restaurants, name of the restaurants, look at the first four, at the Shack LLC, the very first one has an extraneous space right here. This upsets me. I must destroy this space. It's become the focus of my life momentarily. To destroy this space, we can use something like the string trim function. Right? The idea here, too, is basically every character column in our data set could have these extra spaces that annoy me in them. And I want to make sure to destroy all of them simultaneously as efficiently as possible. So to do this, I'm going to say, replace the restaurant's data with the restaurant's data and then mutate across where is dot character. Where is dot character selects every character data column in the entire data set. If say I was back on my survey data set, the Denver U survey with its 80 some thousand columns, this would select every character column in that data set. So I don't have to manually figure out which of the 85,000 of them or however are uh, character columns. Then I say, essentially, apply to every one of those columns, string trim. Now I look head unique restaurant's name, and that space that was momentarily driving me insane is now gone. Okay, I'm no longer angry. My anger has been dealt with. I have destroyed all of the extraneous space. This is one of those useful sorts of things to do, like the across function shown on that prior slide. Instead of naming the Columns specifically, I just say where is dot character. This is a good one to kind of remember for when you want to do something like maybe across all your numeric columns, you want to standardize them. You could say where is dot numeric scale and standardize every single column in the data set. Common thing I do before structural equation modeling. Yeah. Uh oh. Doctors. Does string str trim, does that only apply to white spaces at the end of uh, a string? Beginning or end, but not in the middle. OK, got it. Yep. If you want to remove duplicate, duplicate spaces, like more than one space in a row inside a string, you can use string squish. And it will replace every what, every in every element that is more than one space in a row with a single space, and it will also get rid of extraneous white space on the outsides of it. Okay. Oh, so it'll, it'll do both at the same time? Yeah. Cool. You can also tell to turn off one or more of those functionalities. I think it has options built into it. All right. Yeah. So, string trim. Second, let me close the door that was opened by this floof. Yeah. Make a noise, cat. I know life is hard. Yeah, you're okay. Okay. Ah. Oh, poor neglected cat. He's just it's been it's been a hard day for you, cat, hasn't it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, no, she actually she's a free feeder, so she's never unfed. Uh, she does yell when she briefly uncovers the bottom of the bowl, um, but that's it. And that's of course triggers her immediate instinct that she's going to starve to death within the next five minutes and cause a screaming. Now, this noise here is just that she's awake now and she wants me to know that. Okay. So uh, I would pick her up and wave her around, but she's in her box and she displayed that she's not interested in being picked up or pet, but she does want my attention from a distance. Okay. So 
Uh, next section here, very important, is regular expressions and pattern matching, the most important sort of part of the lecture today, and honestly, one of the most powerful things you can learn in this class. Okay, so first thing, what are regular expressions? So regular expressions or regexes, some people say like regex or something, now it's regexes. Regexes are uh, a way to describe patterns that we're looking for in text. They're basically search terms. It's a way to describe these in a way the computer can understand. We will write an expression, a regular expression, apply it to a string input, and then we can do things with the matches that that regular expression produces. So it's essentially like writing a search term. It returns a bunch of results, and then we can do something to those results. Okay, so these regexes uh, are composed of um, multiple components in them. So uh, the first thing are literal characters. Literal characters are defined snippets you want to search for in some text. Like way back when we uh, did homework five, uh, we wanted to search for SEA. Technically, it was SEA with a space. We searched for SEA. Maybe we want instead the number 206 to get 206 area codes from phone numbers. These are literal characters because we actually just want to find that exact text. Okay. Then there's a whole monstrous pile of things that are not literal characters. These things are called meta characters. Meta characters are things to allow us to be flexible in describing patterns. This includes all of these characters, backslashes, carrots, dollar signs, periods, pipes, question marks, asterisks, plus signs, parentheses, square brackets, curly braces, all of these things, which I often call squigglies because it's more fun. So if you want to search for one of these meta characters as a literal character, that is, you want to find actual dollar signs in your text, you must do a thing called escaping these characters. To escape a character, you must precede it with two backslashes. If you want to use a regular expression to search for the literal text, parenthesis 206 parenthesis, including those parentheses, you unfortunately have to type it like this backslash backslash parenthesis. This escapes the parenthesis and tells R. I'm looking for that parenthesis. I don't want to treat the parenthesis as a meta character of some kind. We're going to talk a little bit in a while what those parentheses do as a meta character. So backslash backslash parenthesis 206 backslash backslash parenthesis. This would search for the actual text parenthesis 206 parenthesis. We're going to see some examples of this in a bit. Okay. So there's a lot of these meta characters. They all do special things. Don't memorize them. There's too many of them to memorize. Figure out ones that you use consistently doing regular expressions and master those and Google the other ones you eventually need to do some really weird stuff. Regular expressions are a very deep thing and people who are masters of regular expressions can do arcane wizardry with their uh, um, character data searches. Okay, so let's put these regular expressions to use in rapidly escalating examples of uh, regular expressions. So here's an example. What I want to do is take my restaurant's data and I want to get the inspections just for the coffee shops. Um, I want to look at and figure out which coffee shops in the data are likely to poison me. You'd think a coffee shop wouldn't be able to kill me, but some of them somehow managed to accrue terrible health code violations, and I want to know where those coffee shops are. So I'm going to say a coffee shop is anything that has the text coffee, espresso, or roaster in the name. That's not going to capture all of them. There might be cafes and stuff, but maybe a lot of cafes, there aren't really coffee shops. They serve all kinds of other stuff. Okay, the regular expression for coffee or espresso or roaster is coffee or espresso or roaster. Because the pipe character, which we've used before in logical expressions, is also the or character in regular expressions. Okay, so the statement here is coffee or espresso or roaster. So to do this, to search for these things, though, I need to use them in an actual string or function. 
So I'm going to say, let's create a new data frame of only the restaurants that are coffee shops. I'm going to assign to it. Ah, the cat returns. Come on. Come on, you savage. What are you doing? No, to the skies. To the skies. Mm. Yeah. OK, there's the cat. Bear witness to the floof. She's very floofy and she's very loud. Isn't that right? Yeah, what's up? What's up? Yeah, I know. You want to get back to your box? Or you want to know? Okay, go down. Oh, yeah, big furs, you know. Nope, but I'm sorry. Oh, now you don't want to get down. This is my life. <sighs> She's like, it's time. It's time to teach. No, it's time to pet. Okay, I will teach with her in my lap. Okay, she is the floof. Her name is Stella, but I usually call her Dr. Sausages for no particular reason. So anyway, um, yeah, so what I'm doing here, I'm going to create this uh, coffee data frame. I'm going to assign to it the restaurant data, and then I'm going to filter down to the rows that indicate its coffee shops. To do that, I'm going to use the stringer function string detect. String detect takes a vector name, which contains character data, and a single regular expression, and string detect returns a true if it finds any match for this regular expression, and a false if it does not find a match. So what it's going to do is go through every one of the 258,000 names in my data frame, and if it finds the words in all caps, coffee, or the word espresso, or the word roaster, if it finds any of those three, it returns a true, thus resulting in a data frame subset down to rows containing coffee, espresso, or roaster, everything else gets dropped. If I take my new coffee data frame and then go to distinct names of restaurants and then the first six observations, we see this. The names are Two Sisters Espresso, 701 Coffee, 909 Coffee and Wine, AJ's Espresso, Alki Homefront Smoothies and Espresso, All City Coffee. So this regular expression seems to have worked. It found me names containing coffee, espresso, or roaster, and allowed me to filter down to the rows that have them in it. Does that make sense? String detect is super handy. I use it all the time for filtering character data calls. Sometimes they even use it for finding patterns of numbers too. It's quite powerful and flexible. Okay. So. Now I can answer the question, will my coffee kill me? What I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna take a look at each unique business identifier, keep only its most recent inspection score and then display a histogram of those scores. So I say, take my coffee data and then select business ID, name, inspection score and date, and then group it by its business ID and then filter so date equals the maximum date within that business ID. This right here is a way to get the most recent inspection for each one of the businesses, because each business probably has a different inspection date, but whatever business I'm looking at, its most recent inspection will always be the maximum date in that particular uh, um, business. Then I get distinct, uh, uh, distinct rows. So what this is gonna do here is give me, make sure I only have, I don't have any duplicate rows within each business. Then I just plot my inspection scores as a histogram. And we see here, as one would hope, most coffee places don't have any health code violations at all because they're like serving coffee. But somehow there are coffee shops out here with 40 plus violation points, um, which is pretty incredible. I mean, maybe those places also serve a lot of other things or something, but that seems like a lot. Okay. So anyway, some out there might poison you. Next one we might want to play around with. The function, um, so actually, first of all, I guess I'll just read the text here. So, okay, now what I want to do, uh, what I want to do here is find all of the uh, rows in my data, say, um, that are phone numbers that are in the 206 area code, the classic Seattle area code. Ah, so here's a question. What would be a quick way to find out the name of that shop? A quick way to find out the name of that shop um, would be to say, take um, 
uh, basically run everything up to right before we pipe it into the ggplot. Um, and then probably arrange my data by inspection score descending. Yeah, exactly what was suggested by Kaylee here. Arrange the data by maximum inspection score and then look at the top of the data frame. Because it might be even more than one down here with like that 40 range. It's kind of hard to tell. Yeah. Okay. So, <clears throat> okay. What we want to do here is let's find all the classic 206 area code uh, Seattle numbers. Um, okay. The thing about it, though, is because this is administrative data and they don't sanitize the inputs to their database, all the phone numbers can have totally different formats. We can have phone numbers like 206, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, parentheses 206, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, parentheses 1, 2, 3, dash 4, 5, 6, 7, or like 555, dash 206, dash 1, 2, 3, 4. If I want 206 area codes, I want to correctly recover this phone number, this phone number, and this phone number, but I don't want to pull this phone number because, well, it has 206 here. It does not have a 206 area code. Okay, so this is a tricky thing. This is very easy to explain in language what we want to get. You would say, I want any 206 area code number. What do I mean by an area code? I want any phone number that begins with a 206 whether or not that 206 is surrounded by parentheses. Easy for me to say out loud in sort of an unambiguous fashion, any of you could then figure out what kind of phone numbers I'm after. The computer does not speak the same language that I do. So instead, what we're gonna do is we're gonna give it an expression that looks like this, and I'll show you right away it works because we say string detect on these phone test examples using this pattern I assign, and I get a true, 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 false meaning it matches this, this, and this, but fails to match this last one. Now you're asking, how? So the regular expression I'm giving it is this. I'm giving it caret, remember the name of this symbol is a caret, caret backslash backslash parenthesis question mark 206. So let's figure out what this does left to right. So. Caret here is an important meta character in regular expressions. This is a meta character that means look only at the beginning of the string. It is referred to as an anchor. The way anchors work is this caret here, if I put in a regular expression, anything I match after it must be adjacent to the beginning of the string. This will prevent it from finding a 206 in the middle of the phone number. It has to be at the beginning or it won't be able to match. The next thing is backslash backslash parenthesis question mark. As I said on that prior slide, if I want to search for a literal parenthesis, I got to do backslash backslash parenthesis. This says, okay, I'm looking for an actual parenthesis, not the meta character parenthesis. So I do two slashes to escape it. The thing is, is some phone numbers have that parenthesis, but some do not. If you add a question mark after a component of a regular expression like this, it makes it optional. This says if you find a parenthesis there, match it. If there's no parenthesis, that's okay. Keep moving on to the next part of the regular expression. The next part of the regular expression is the literal characters 206. Okay? So if I read through how this regular expression works on each one of these, it first, using a caret, begins at the beginning of this number, 206123. It then looks for a parenthesis and does not find a parenthesis, but it's okay with that. Then it finds a 206. It's completed the regular expression. It matches it. This next one, it starts at the beginning of the regular expression. It looks for a parenthesis. It immediately finds it. It's okay with that. It then finds a 206. It's made its match. In comparison, for this one here, it looks at the beginning of the string. Then it looks for a parenthesis. It's okay that it didn't find a parenthesis, but if it doesn't find a parenthesis, it's sure expecting the number two. It finds a number five, it already fails. It doesn't match to this regular, to this pattern or to this uh, string. Does that make sense? It's okay if it's a little confusing. Okay. Got questions? Go for it. If not, I will continue to escalate these until your brain starts to melt.
Good, let us continue. Okay, before I go on to more exact, or power, or sorry, not more powerful, uh, more complicated ones, um, it's good to know about this function. Stringer has a function called string view that allows you to see in a viewer pane exactly what text your regular expression is selecting in any given vector. So if I do something like string view my phone test examples from the prior slide area code 206 pattern, it will pop up a little window showing what it is matched on each one of those examples. It highlights it. This is kind of a handy thing if you want to know whether your regular expression is actually matching what you intend it to match. An important thing to know here, though, is it will display the entire vector of matches that you uh, give it. Do not attempt to generate a page with hundreds of thousands of these matches. Do not give it like the entire restaurant's vector. It will try to make a web page that big, and it will fill up the memory on your computer, and it will crash it. So you should try and avoid doing that. Try and give it a snippet, like 20 observations or something, and then display that in the viewer. It's kind of like with a ggplot. Don't try and plot like 500,000 points on your plot. It's probably going to get upset. It will do it, but it will take a bunch of time. OK. So more string detect. So maybe what we want to do is we want to know how many phone numbers are in these 206 area code, uh, or in the 206 area code. So to figure it out, I'm going to say, take the restaurant's data, and then mutate, does it have a 206 number? Is going to be equal to the result of string detect, all the phone numbers, the area code 206 pattern I used on the prior slide, and then I'm just going to count if they have a 206 number or not. What we see in our restaurant's data is that 67,000 about of the numbers do not have a 206 area code, but 110,000 of them do. And about 83,000 don't have a phone number listed at all. Okay, so this is a way to use string detect to say create a binary variable. You could instead put it in an if else statement and use it to assign values or something like that. You can do what you want. Cat loves to continuously open and close the door, and I'm trying not to be loud to everyone else in the house and hear yelling at a microphone, but instead the cat's like, now, 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 open the door to hell with you. I love you, cat, but no, nah, I just love you, cat. I'm not complaining. So anyway, um, yeah, now this is a way to create a variable or something with string tech, put into some use. Okay. So here's another thing we might want to do. Instead of just detecting whether a string is found or not, Maybe we want to actually extract the portion of that string that matches the regular expression that we're using. So for example, let's extract the directional part of Seattle addresses. If you spent much of any time in Seattle, you've probably realized um, that you can tell what area of the city an address is, is like in the city um, by whether it has a north, northwest, southeast, no street identifier or something. Right, these the city is divided up into these sort of. Um, they're not exactly. I don't know. If there's like eight of them. Nine, I guess there are a full nine of them. Directionals, but they're all kind of different sizes. But you kind of know where everything is in relation to the core of the city based on if it's a north northwest. You know what streets it's in between, stuff like that. Okay, so we might want to figure out where all the restaurants are in Seattle based on the directionals. Okay, so here's a way to do that. So I'm going to walk through this pattern in a bit. This is a big kind of a messy looking regular expression. But the idea is, let's say we have example text like this, 2812 Thorndike Avenue West, 512 Northwest 65th Street, 407 Cedar Street, 15 Nickerson Street. What we want to extract from these addresses is the directional. So for 2812 Thorndike Avenue West, we just want to get the West. For 512 Northwest 65th Street, we want to get the Northwest. For 407 Cedar Street, it doesn't have a directional, so we don't want to get anything. 15 Nickerson Street doesn't have a directional, we don't want to get it. But importantly, we don't want to extract like the N here thinking it's a North or something like that, right? We don't want to pick out these extra things, we want to just get the W Northwest and so on. Okay, so what we're going to do is this direction pattern here. And you'll see the way regular expressions work is you have to come up with a little bit of a logic. So I look at like 2012 North, Dy North Thorndike Avenue West, 
512 Northwest 65th Street, and I look what this West and this Northwest have in common. The first thing I see here is that both the West and the Northwest are preceded by a space. Every directional in the data set will always be preceded by a space because no address begins with a directional. Okay, that's useful information. So I'm gonna say my pattern always begins with a space. It's not gonna get anything at the beginning of any of these addresses or anything. It always begins with a space. The next thing is, well, after the space is always gonna be the directional itself. So I say I would like to match north or northwest or northeast or south or southwest, southeast, west or east. Any of these will work. But the thing is, is if I put it all in parentheses, the parentheses are something called a group. In groups like this, um, it will select exactly one of these things. If I put a bunch of ors, any one of them will do, but it will only match to one of them. This is a way to set aside individual chunks of a regular expression to do a match or something like that that just stands alone. So it will happily match any one of these things. Next, I see something here. So Northwest ends and then has a space. West is at the end of the word. So, or end of the, uh, the whole address. So I can think to myself, okay, after the directional itself, there's only two options. It will either be followed by a space or it will be followed by the end of the string. On the prior example, I showed you a caret, the little uh, exponen exponentiation type thing, that anchors to the beginning of a string. Dollar sign anchors to the end of the string. So what this pattern says is, first match any space you see, but that space must be followed by one of these directional letters or pairs of letters, and then it must be immediately followed by either a space or the end of the string. So when it matches 2812 uh, Thorndike Avenue, it goes like this. Two, nope, eight, nope, one, nope, two, nope, space. Hey, a space works for me, but a T doesn't match any of these things. Keep going. Oh, a space here, an A doesn't match any of these things. Oh, a space here, and then a W does match one of these. That's good. Move to the next thing. Space doesn't match, but the end of the string does. So it successfully matches that W. For 512 Northwest Street, it sees, oh good, it begins with a space, then it has the Northwest, and then it is followed by a space. This matches also, it's going to match both spaces on either side and the NW. The result of running these direction examples, string extract the direction patterns, it doesn't give me trues and falses, it gives me the exact text that matched my regular expression. So we see we matched a space W here, space W, but for this one, we matched space Northwest space. So string extract doesn't give you the whole thing or anything. It just gives you the exact text that your regular expression matched to. If we wanted to use string trim with string extract, how would we combine those into one line? Probably like this on this next slide here. Um, so what we probably want to do is discard those uh, extra spaces on there because they're stupid. So rather than try and make the regular expression not return the spaces, it's easier to, as Sam here is suggesting, cut them off with string trim. So if we want to do it in one go, we do it like this. I'm going to say take the restaurant's data and then go to only distinct addresses in the data and then mutate a city region variable equal to the result of string trimming the result of the string extract on every address using my direction pattern. In this case, I just nested the string extract inside the string trim, and then I'm going to get a count of city regions and then arrange by descending n. And what we see is the um, largest concentration of restaurants is in the northeast side of the city, which isn't surprising because I think it's the largest section of the city, followed by the south, the city core, the north, southeast, southwest, east, northwest, and finally the west. Okay, that makes sense. Cool, cool. 
Yeah, so this is already something maybe a little bit handy. We want to chop off like a single little bit of the string. So this is kind of like substring, but it's a little bit more flexible. Because if we go back to this, we couldn't have used a substring for any specific location to get the west and the northwest. So instead we said, no, 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 string extract and have it flexible and kind of look for a window to grab exactly what we want. So this is drastically more powerful than something like substrings and almost always the first thing that occurs to me is to do this with a string extract and a substring even if they're in a fixed location because i'm so used to using regular expressions to do stuff i showed this in lab on monday okay so next thing except i showed it with string remove which is the inversion of this okay here let's talk about string replace which again is sort of like an inversion of that prior operation so maybe what we want to do is something like a street level analysis of inspections in our restaurants data. That is, we want to do something like compare uh, University Way, otherwise called the AV for some reason, to Pike Street. Okay? So to do that, we need to take all those addresses and remove all the building numbers, which is a complicated thing because of how stupid building numbers are in most cities. So. I'll show you first some examples before I go through this mess of a regular expression. So our examples look again like stuff like 2812 Thorndike Avenue West, maybe just First Avenue here and they didn't have a building number. Maybe 10A First Avenue, 10-A First Avenue, 5201-B University Way Northeast, and then annoying addresses like 7040 and a half 15th Avenue Northwest because that is a thing that happens, okay? So what we want to do is we want to delete the 2812 in the space, nothing here, the 10A in the space, the 5201-B in space, the 7040 and a half. We want to delete all of that stuff, but leave intact normal street numbers and normal street names. Okay, so first let me show you that this actually works. I run this number pattern here, which I'm going to walk through on the next slide. I say, take my number examples, string replace in those number examples, the number pattern that it matches here, replace them with nothing. This is actually the same as the word string delete function or string remove function rather. It's kind of like paste, paste zero thing. String remove, instead of giving you a replacement, it just deletes whatever it matches. It's exactly the same result here. What we see is all that junk I didn't want has been removed from all these addresses. Okay, let's walk through how this mess is getting what we want. Okay, so how does that regex work? Let's break it down. So the first part of this is a caret zero to nine in brackets. So again, as we said earlier, or as I said earlier, a caret means look at the beginning of the string. So all of the building numbers, the street numbers, all that kind of stuff, um, the addresses should be at the beginning of the string. That's at least one nice thing about this is we know it's all going to be the beginning. So I can say start looking at the beginning. Brackets are something kind of like parentheses, except they give you sets of things. If I say bracket zero through nine, it means find any numeric digit between zero and nine. So it figures out that this also means the numbers one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. Okay, so it gives me a range. Zero through nine is every number, right? Every single digit number anyway. Okay, so we're now matching. Look at the beginning of a string and then find any one number. The thing is, though, is there could be an arbitrary number of numbers. It could be like one first street, but it could also be 4200 first street. And I want to match all those numbers, no matter how many there are. To do that, I can use an asterisk. Asterisk means match this thing one or more times. So this will match any number zero through nine and then continue matching any numbers zero through nine until it, it gets to every single number that occurs uh, in that chunk of them. There could be one number digit. There could be a hundred of them. Okay, It's perfectly fine. Ah, here's a good question. Why do you use zero through nine instead of zero colon nine? Because zero colon nine is not valid regular expression syntax for a set of the numbers zero to nine. 
So this syntax and the stuff we use on regular expressions is not our code. It is its own language called regular expressions. And this is the syntax for a set of numbers zero to nine. I actually don't know what zero colon nine is. I don't think colon is anything in set notation, but it could be, oh, actually colon, colon is usually used to separate out certain special sets. So you could do like, uh, God, I forgot what it is, like colon A colon to get all alphanumerics or something like that. There's a lot of weird stuff like that. Yeah, but it does just doesn't work is the answer for that. Okay. okay, so now we're getting match the beginning of the string any number of numbers in a row. Okay, well, the thing is, is that some of these are stupid and they have a hyphen and then some other thing like an A, B after the hyphen, but they don't always have a hyphen. So I'm saying here hyphen question mark to optionally match a hyphen. This means, okay, if a hyphen happens after the numbers, match it. If there isn't one there, that's perfectly fine. Next, normally when there is a hyphen, it's usually hyphen and then some letter, like 5201-B. Well, I want to match that B. So again, I can use set notation here and say, okay, a set, give me any letter A through Z. Well, that's every capital letter in uh, the English language, so it'll match literally any letter. The thing is, is in the stuff that I looked at in my examples, I only ever saw single letters. I never saw any multiple letters. So I'm happy to just match any single capital letter. And it's optional again, because I could have an address like 4200, or I could have 4201-B. So I optionally match that dash and B. Okay. Next, I match a space. Because no matter what, in any of these addresses, after the numeric part of the address, which could include letters because they're stupid, um, could include a space, but it must have a space. It never just keeps going on to something else without a space there. So I match on a space. Then, because this is sometimes a thing in addresses, I optionally also match a one half space as an optional. You'll notice here you can make an entire set of text optional by putting in parentheses and putting the exclamation, or not exclamation, but the question mark afterwards. So this says optionally match the entire text one half space or not. Okay. So this is a complex regular expression. It's matching any number and then optionally matches all this junk and this junk. So if you were writing this regular expression, you would not write this entire thing off the top of your head. Instead, what you would do is probably first start like this, being like, well, I know they all start at the beginning of, of the address. I know they're always begin with something numeric. And then you'd say, but they can be multiple numbers. So you'd probably do all of this in a space and then see what kind of results you get. And then you'd start to see a whole bunch of dash whatevers. And then you'd add, okay, fine, dash whatever. And then you scroll through them and suddenly see there's a whole bunch of one halves floating around. And then you'd be like, okay, fine. And then you add a whole bunch of what, then add one half to it. And finally, you'd see it looks like you got all the addresses right. And you'd be like, okay, there, I guess this regular expression works. That's how every regular expression you ever write is going to work. You're going to iteratively add on to them until you get what you want. Okay. Oh, that's a good one. Would there be a relatively easy way to match against any fraction? Yeah, um, within reason, you could do, for instance, uh, um, parenthesis bracket zero to probably not zero, but bracket like maybe one. I mean, maybe not even a range. They'd probably all be like one over, but maybe not. I don't know. Uh, maybe there's going to be a two thirds. You could do bracket zero to nine. Who knows? Maybe there's going to be a zero in that. Uh, um, numerator, and then bracket again, hopefully not dividing by zero, but maybe bracket zero through nine there, um, and then consider how many digits you need. So if you were wanted truly any arbitrary fraction, no matter how stupid, uh, as long as it wasn't decimal, you could do uh, zero through nine, like bracket zero through nine asterisks slash bracket zero through nine asterisk, and that would get any arbitrary whole numbered fraction. If you wanted to get decimals, you could add an optional statement um, with like, and then optionally a period arbitrary number of numbers uh, bracketed, right? You can chain these things together and do all kinds of crazy shit. Um, regular expressions are very powerful. Basically, the answer is there is 
always some way to do it, but how what you consider relatively easy depends heavily on your regular expression fluency and how willing you are to go mad troubleshooting your regular expression. <clears throat> okay. So now we put them to use. I'm going to say overwrite my restaurant's data with a new restaurant's data and then mutate a street only column equal to string remove from the addresses that number pattern. I now look restaurants and then distinct streets only and then head 10, the first 10 observations, and we see I'm immediately upset already. Southwest Avalon Way looks great, Mercer Street looks great, Fairview Avenue North Unit 1700A has upset me because the street is there, but there's also unit 1700A, which is not part of the street. It's something else I need to delete. Similarly, number 125 and whatever the hell BLC-08 is, okay? So my streets still have problems. So what we need to do is purge the other side of these things uh, out of my addresses. So what we want to do is get rid of all the units and the suites and all that other junk out of here to try and get a proper street address. So this is not a thorough one. If you really had to do this for work or something, you'd end up having to search and pull out a lot of other things too. But a basic first attempt at this might be, okay, let's get rid of anything with a pound sign, hashtag for the kids, sweet suite, shop, or unit, and literally anything in the address that occurs after that. Okay, so a simple regular expression for that would be this unit pattern. I'm going to say first match a space because all those things are going to be preceded by a space, then match any of these. Pound sign, suite, suite, shop, or unit, and then period asterisk dollar sign, which I'll cover on the next slide. So if I have example addresses like First Avenue, Rainier Avenue South, number A, number A is somehow an address that exists in Seattle. How does this make any sense? Give me a heart attack. Fauntleroy Way Southwest Suite 108, Fourth Avenue number 100C. Well, you're pretty close to being a number. Northwest 54th Street. Okay, these are real ones that are in there. If I use this pattern on it, I get nice clean addresses out. So this thing works. How does it work? Works like this. First thing we do, we're going to match a space. No matter what these things are, they always occur with a space before them first. Next, we're going to match any one of these things, number, suite, suite, shop, or unit. But then, based on what I said earlier, I don't care what we match after that. Just delete everything that occurs after suite, suite, shop, or unit. Okay. So what period does is period is the universal meta character in regular expressions. Period matches any character. Anything at all that exists will match um, if you include a period. Okay. And then I say match a period as many times as you want. Period asterisk is a way to select an infinite number of characters in a sequence. It will take any characters of any kind, an infinite number of them to the universal selector and then go until the end of the string, okay? So this means it won't match unless it first finds space and one of these things, but then it will match everything from that until the end of the string, no matter how many characters there are. If there's a million characters occurring after shop, it will match every single one of them to the end of the string and then delete them as they deserve, okay? So we can apply it. Now I say, Override my restaurant's data with the restaurant's data and then mutate a street only, which is the result of string trimming to get rid of the extraneous spaces that are going to pop up as a result of my operation. String remove from the street only address from before, the unit pattern, then look at the first 11 distinct observations and it looks much better. Southwest Avalon Way, whatever. Fairview Avenue North without some sort of weird building number. I left this one in because when I first did these slides a long while back, I wasn't sure what BLC-08 is, um, but I think it's actually a um, uh, like one unit in a strip mall in Renton. And so technically it's like um, BLC-8, it's like, like unit C-08, so I could probably remove that too, but I wasn't sure about it, um, so I left it in. Okay, because I thought, you know, who knows what it is. Uh, yeah, anyway, so it seems to do the job. We've purged all that crap from it. So fairly complicated operation. Okay, 
So now let's put it to use. So let's figure out um, what streets in Seattle have the most 45 plus point inspections. Let's see where danger lurks in the city. So I'm gonna say, take the restaurant's data and then filter to only inspection scores of at least of over 45 points, which is really high. Let me tell you, that's a lot of health code violations. And then get distinct business IDs, dates, inspection scores, and streets, because we want those streets. Then just count the number of these bad inspections by street, arrange in descending order, and look at the first five. Well, as you might expect, danger lurks where delicious food lurks, and I'm not going to stop eating in all these different streets. University Way Northeast, nope, not going to stop eating in the, U in the uh, uh, district. South Jackson Street, well, that's the International District. I'm not going to stop doing that. Pacific Highway South, Up Aurora, all kinds of good food. Not going to stop going there. Northeast 24th Street, Nope, not gonna stop eating there. Rainier Avenue South, nope, not gonna stop eating there. So I guess where danger lurks is where I'm still gonna go and get poison. Um, but yeah, so we found out something interesting. We know where bad inspections are. Honestly, it's just where more restaurants are. You could instead divide by the number of restaurants or something like that and figure it out, okay? So here's a question. What's the difference between uh, asterisk and question mark. Also, it seems like Unit Street or something could be a place. This would also remove that right. Yeah, first of all, Unit Street, it would totally delete those. That was sort of the type of thing you'd have to deal with. You'd have to um, figure out how to make your regular expression delete the things you actually want to get rid of, but not the things you don't. Um, uh, but yeah, it could be if that was the case. Uh, the other thing, the difference between asterisk and question mark, so they're vaguely related, but asterisk must match must match at least one of them, where a question mark would optionally match one or none, but asterisk can match one or more than one, whereas the question mark would only match one or none. So they perform a related but slightly different thing. Does that make sense? Yeah. You could also do um, period asterisk in parentheses, question mark outside of it, and then it would be zero or more characters. So you could optionally match nothing or anything as many times. Okay. I think there's also a special character for that, but I can't remember. Okay. So we know where danger lurks. Next. <clears throat> Something else useful. Um, you can split up strings into component parts using tidy r separate that we saw back in week five. Another useful one is string split. String split will split a string based into a uh, either a list or a matrix based on some regular expression. So if, for instance, we looked at the violation descriptions, we'd see the violation descriptions look like 4300 dash non-food contact services maintained and cleaned. If I only wanted the number or I only wanted this or I wanted them in their own columns, I could say string split, in this case fixed, split the violation descriptions by space dash this, the first, the thing on the left side of the space dash space would go in one column. The thing on the right side would go on another column. String split is a way to divide things up, one string into multiple strings. I don't use it too often like in dplyr, but it's something I often use inside of other functions that I write for prepping string data. Okay, so here's an odd sort of thing you might want to do at some point. Um, maybe you have something like a report or a website where you need to dynamically generate sentences or paragraphs of text from data. Maybe you need it to do it on the fly. So every time you knit it, it generates different text. You can use stringer functions to sort of automatically assemble sentences. Um, so what I'm doing right here, this isn't too important. I'm just prepping some recent scores in the data first. I'm saying loading up Luber date so I can get some dates and times. My recent scores are going to be the restaurant's data selected down to name, address, city, inspection score, and date. I'm going to remove missing inspection scores, group them by name, get the uh, worst inspection score first, slice off and keep only that worst inspection score, ungroup my data, mutate my name, address, and city columns, and change them to title case so they look nice. Mutate my inspection date to be a proper MDY of the inspection date. That is a proper month, day, and year date. Um, and then sample just three observations to play with on the next slides. This isn't too important what I did here, but that's what I did. Okay. So, turns out 
you could just give a lot of arguments to paste and use paste to string a sentence together. So uh, one thing I answer here is I'm using the scales library to get ordinal day text, not too important how I do that. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say, I'm going to take these recent scores and then I'm going to mutate and create a text description of the inspection scores. This is going to be equal to the result of pasting together the name of the restaurant is located at this address in the city and it received a score of the inspection score on the month it was inspected in, the ordinal day it was inspected in, and then the year that it was inspected in. So this code here says, give me the month of the inspection date, return it as a label instead of a numeric and do not abbreviate it. This says, take the ordinal day of the inspection date. And this says, take the year of the inspection date numeric. What this is gonna do is paste together text like, Supreme Bean again is located at 14424 Ambam Boulevard Southwest in Birian and received a score of so-and-so and so, but it runs off here, the text onto the right. And I will address this in a minute so we can see the full text it's generated. So this is essentially a dynamically generated sentence. Every sentence is the same. Some of these things are the same, like is located at, but I've used a variable data from different columns to populate different fields in here. Well, another way to do this is with a package called glue in R that automatically gets loaded when you load stringer. To use the glue package, you can use string underscore glue and instead give this beautiful syntax instead of paste and shit. This here is squiggly bracket name is located at address in city. And then once I've run out of space on the line, I can just go to a new line just for my convenience. You can break these up however you want to make them readable and received a score of squiggly inspection score on squiggly code, squiggly code, squiggly quote. The way string glue works is you give it just complete text written out where our code or variables goes in squiggly brackets. And you can write anything you want. It's exactly the same thing as this over here, but it's a lot easier to read and write. So glue just as a way to dynamically insert R code in the middle of text in here in a nice format. The result is identical to the prior uh, slides results. You can actually see if we browse that the text isn't changing across slides. These are exactly equivalent. Use whichever one of these is easier for you to write. Glue is pretty handy and powerful for this sort of thing. So if you're going to write lots of sentences, I recommend using glue. Okay. Well, something else we might want to do. This has pasted out text that's all on a single line. Maybe I'd like it to print in my console nicely. To do that, what I could do is I could dynamically and automatically insert line breaks so it prints nicely in my console. So what I'm going to do here is say, take my score text and then pull out the text description column I just created and then string wrap width equals 70. What string wrap width equals 70 says is make each line of text at most 70 characters wide. If it hits 70 characters, insert a line break. And then on top of it, I'm pasting in double line breaks here. What this is going to do is add a paragraph break between each element of this vector. And then I cap them together, which is basically similar to doing a paste collapse but it prints it to the console directly. Now our sentences are readable. And it says, Supreme Bean again is located at 14424 Ambon Boulevard Southwest in Birian and received a score of 10 on January 24th, 2017, so on and so forth. Dynamically generated sentences that could be automatically spit out into a report or like an a automated interface, like a dashboard or something like that. Okay? This is how you generate text uh, like this programmatically and automatically in R. Any questions about that? <clears throat> okay. So some other useful functions. 
Useful functions include string pad. String pad is the inverse of string trim. This will make your string padded out to a given minimum width, and you can specify where you want it padded out and with what. This is a good way to add back in leading zeros on a zip code if those leading zeros have been cut off. You say string, how wide you want the string, what side you want to add stuff to, and what you want to add. So for a zip code, it would be the zip code. You want to be five digits. You want to pad it out on the left side. And you want to pad it with zeros. Okay. String subset is kind of like uh, string detect, but instead of returning trues and falses, it returns the actual entire string that contains any match. It doesn't extract the, the only the match. It extracts the entire string, though. You give it a string, you give it a pattern. String which is like string detect, except instead of giving trues and falses, it gives numeric indices of the elements that match the pattern. String replace all is like string replace, except it does multiple replacements simultaneously. And you can give it a named vector to do multiple different replacements and replace with different things for each thing you want to replace. And string squish I mentioned earlier, this removes and trims the space on the outside of the string and also removes duplicate spaces on the inside of the string. All sorts of handy stuff. Okay, so next, uh, homework six part two is due next week. We'll walk through it on Monday's lab. Peer review is due the week after for that one. Um, I will be fairly out of contact uh, starting tomorrow morning through Sunday evening. If you've got questions for me, um, try and focus on tonight. Otherwise, I'll be slow to respond for a few days. Um, I'm going on a trip for a bit, and I will return on Sunday evening, um, hopefully recharge to finish my dissertation in two and a half weeks. Uh, without breaking down into tears or something like that. So uh, anyway, um, that's it for today. I'm done a little early. If you got questions for me, hit me up. Otherwise, um, please leave. Thank you. I will enjoy my trip. The idea of taking a trip is novel and bizarre. <laughs> Let's see. Stop.